Are we ready for the word of God? Yeah, are you ready? 1 Samuel 24, 1 in the NIV version. I'm going to be reading. Read it in your own phones, in the screen. If you have a paper Bible that is even more spiritual, and God will bless you more. He will reveal his heart even better to you. It's awesome. <laughs> At least you can sweat and cry on top of it. At least, you know, it is what it is. All jokes. But let's go to 1 Samuel 24, 1. Are you ready? And it says, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, and Philistines actually mean the people without covenants, people that were not from God. He was told David is in the desert of Engadi, of Engedi. It depends on what you want to read it like. So Saul took 3,000 able, not unable, able young men from Israel and set out to look for David and his men near to the crags of the wild goats. We'll go back to the goats in a minute. He came to the sheep pens, verse 3, along the way and a cave was there. And so went in to relieve himself. And we're going to leave that there. David and his men were far back in the cave, in the toilet. The men said, this is the day. The men said, I love men like that, right? Oh, they always have a good, wise thing to say. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with you with as you wish. Then David crept and crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Verse 5 says, and afterwards, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed or lay my hand on him for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply, it was definitely not 2022 because people get offended nowadays, sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David, verse 8, went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my lord, the king. When Saul looked behind, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face on the ground. And he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he's the Lord's anointed. See, my father. Look at this piece of your rope in my hand. I cut off the corner of your rope, but you didn't, I didn't kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. For the sake of time, let's jump into the 15th verse and says, May the Lord be our judge and decide between us May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. He's not letting him get out of the hook, but he still kind of, he still has his face on the ground. And in verse 19 to 22 reads, when a man, this is Saul speaking, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? So he recognizes and he says, May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and then the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now, swear to me by the Lord, I've been hunting you, but swear to me by God that you will not kill my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. And David, I don't know if you would have done it or I would have done it, but David gave his oath to Saul. And then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Father, thank you for your word. Father, this is more Bible than most of us have read in the whole week, but Father, we know that when you have something special, you want us to read the menu, to be well informed. Father, would you do what you do? Would you speak into us, Lord? 
nourish our hearts, our spirits, Lord, so we can follow you and obey you better, fully. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So let's set the story right. Last week we talked about a hand in the dark. And we talked about, and I'm going to kind of summarize it in seven points. We talked about David and a hand. David was giving a hand to the people because God had given a hand to him. So hands means vulnerability. No, it means reachability. It means authority. And not only authority, it means dominion and influence. So David was actually given in his vulnerability influence. So when it looked like he was losing because he had to depart from a kingdom that was promised to him and he was anointed by God, he was actually declared by a prophet the authority of that moment that he was going to be the king. He had to flee his own kingdom. And there was a lot of confusion because of that. And not only that, David was living in vulnerability. And that is a parallel to what we are living today and we're going to close it in a second. Don't you get a hurry. Also, we talked about God using sometimes the things or the people that are not favorable for us or in situations that are not in favor of us walking with God in our advantage. We didn't only talk about God giving us influence as a congregation, as Christians, as human beings, to be able to love on people in, in uncertain moments. In moments that we don't have it all together, we even talked about God using situations that were wrong, that were unfair to help us, to nourish us. And also, as we could see this as mature Christians, as the grace of God. As we walk with God, we don't need favorable situations only. We need difficulties to be able to understand the grace and how much favor we have. See, that's the gospel. He doesn't want us to be flimsy and weak Christians. He's strengthening us and making our lives stronger by the minute so we are able to serve better, to invest better. Some of us come to just get the fix of the week, but God wants us to grow from that and mature from that. So we're not only waiting for that milk, we're actually able to grab a good plate. So we're able to be of investment afterwards. God is doing something. So he wants us to not only see the benefits of him taking care of us in the midst of the confusion, he wants us to see that our, even our enemies are a blessing when we see them with the eyes of God. When we see them in the eyes of that, that actually planned it ahead for us. He wants us to go beyond. He wants us to go beyond, maybe say to someone, beyond. Beyond, and he wants you to flow independent from the situations that surround you. He wants you to go independent of the pressures and the injustice and maybe even of the abuse. When you are sharing the gospel, when you are pouring your heart into situations and people misjudge your motivations, God wants you to be that kind of Christian that actually has their certainty in God and not what people say and how they treat you. It is not one thing is independent from the rest. Although it might permeate to you, it is independent from that. And God wants us to mature in that sense. He wants us to be able to walk in our faith even when we lack proof that God is with us. Look at the Bible. It's full of stories in the same way. If you don't like it, then this is not your thing. Because when we walk with Christ, most of the times we will have proof. We will have to believe. But it's not by sight. It's by faith that we serve the Lord. So the world wants things to be proven so they can follow. But a disciple, a person that is walking with Christ, is walking even though they don't see. Moses, when he was speaking to the people of Israel, he was the guy that actually brought him out of slavery from Egypt. He said, if you do all these things, the Ten Commandments, the one that you like, and serve all days. He said, if you do all these things, then God... But David had a different tabernacle. And this is the kind of David that we're talking. He is actually around 16, 17 right now. When he was proclaimed king over Israel, he was 14. Somehow, sometimes they say 15. And actually, this is the same guy that killed the giant, remember? When he was 4.5, 5 feet tall, 
and the giant was supposed to be nine, so almost double his height. This is the same man that had been growing. He had not even physically grown completely when God had called him. And he was serving God. And he was living th situations that even if we live them today, oh man, they will be difficult. And I know it's difficult not to be liked on Facebook. I'm a, but that's if you're 30 and above. <coughs> Instagram for the ones that are 30 and underneath that. Uh, don't worry. And TikTok is a different age stream. I don't, I don't hold that. The truth, I don't have authority with that. You know, I don't even have the app. But then we have this man that is actually walking and trying, and trying to understand, navigating in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the turmoil internally and externally, who he is and what he has done in front of God and how God has called him. And I'm going to close this in a second, but I want you to have context. I want you to think. God wants a thinking church. And we want to become a thinking congregation. God wants to give us an anointing to think beyond our age. He wants us to understand concepts that are not about with the maturity that even our family has moved. He wants us to understand that he's the God that invented our brain. And there's more to the story. This is the David. And David was fully there. But before we, we say how he was fully there, we have to say that God wants us. He wants us to have hope. And we talked about a hand in the dark. We were talking about God that reaches into the dark pockets of our life. The things that we hide. The things that David was running from. Even in the midst of that, God was with him. And he's with you. He's with me. And not only that, he actually wants us beyond the distress and the stress and the pressures to understand that he is bringing us out. And although it doesn't happen in one go, it's not an elevator. King. It takes a process. He wants us to understand that we're deeply loved and seen. That in the process, we can understand that we are seen. Although we cannot see it and we don't have proofs, we can understand and stand under the truth that is Christ and he sees us. So that was a hand in the dark. David being kind of a, like a shadow of the Christ that was coming. Actually, Jesus was born out of the lineage of David. David went on and he grew and he became the goat of Israel. And... You think I'm being trendy, no? But no, I just studied the Bible. You just didn't study the Bible, but I'm going to teach you in a minute what it says in the Bible. I'm going to tell you, David was actually where? He was so returned from pursuing the Philistine, he was told that David was in the desert of Engadi. Or Engedi. You know what Engedi means? Oh, Jesus. The spring of the young kid or the spring of the young goat the greatest of all times <laughs> see when culture wants to teach us god has something hey that's a three-pointer you can say hallelujah god wins you know and when things happen like that they happen for a reason david even till today he's the greatest of all kings for israel if you go to israel david is all over the place see the greatest of all times he thirsty he was hiding and God was with him because it doesn't matter how great you are and how you will be remembered even David doesn't even know he was not conscious when he was that age how powerful what his legacy was and what he was living how much it will permeate into your life and in my life he was the greatest of those and sometimes we are in that cave we're in that darkness we're going through those situations and we don't know how effective that word has been how effective your testimony has become this is a man that ditched, that actually made it to the books but you are an open book so this is David the goat the young wild goat another version says that you know hey actually even even that I really says that you know what yeah, they were they were in the crags in the in the in the slit of stone you know the crags of the wild goats 
Actually, and I'll give you a little bit more context. This physically, geographically, is, is, is a place where it's near to the Dead Sea. A, a, a body of water that is full of nutrients that if you open your mouth, you die in 24 hours. But it's stagnant. And in many levels, I wonder if the church is stagnant. We might have all the nutrients, but because our water doesn't flow, those rivers of living water will flow out of us. That's, that's a promise. I wonder if we have become closer to the Dead Sea than to that creek of spring of the wild goats, the ones that were wild in heart, the ones that stay young because the faith is for those that are like kids, isn't it? Or maybe those wild goats that were able to go in through surfaces and terrains that were less than prolific, than extraordinary, than easy. And they were able to keep the faith, maybe like David, a young, wild kid that had a promise. And although he was hiding, although he, he didn't look like the one that was going to be seen as the king, David kept the faith and kept the promise. And he kept his morale. And he kept the principles. He kept the information. He kept the intimacy with God. He kept, he kept, he kept what was valuable. He lost what the world praises, the circumstances, how it looks. He lost his reputation. He explains it. Why do you believe the ones that come against me and say that I have something? He had no reputation. See, today we have a problem. We want more reputation than we want to see the promise. And as congregations around the world, God is wanting to prune us back into the reality. Another interpretation of Engedi or Engadi, it means the pruning of a palm tree. Wow. I don't know if you know what a palm tree is. I come from the Caribbean, so let me give you a piece of information. A palm tree, when it's planted, it grows the first five years. The first cycle of growth grows down. Why? Because in the Caribbean, we have storm or hurricane seasons. And those are the forefronts. When the hurricanes come, the palm trees are the first things that, are get, that get hit in the land. And I don't know you, but I have seen palm trees bend like they were made out of rubber and kiss the ground, kiss the sand, but they don't break. Why? Because their root system goes down. This is the place where the palm trees that were flexible in every season, it doesn't matter what storm hits them, this is the place that where they get, will get pruned. Last week we talked about the cave. We talked about that hand in the dark that prunes us through the darkness and situations. So David is in the middle of the desert that it has a fame for being the place that prunes you, but he's also that wild one that will keep the faith and his relationship with God, even despite situations that are not the best. If we're honest, we need a piece of David, each one of us. If we stop right now, we could take so much richness from this story already. And say, there's so many areas that I have given up. I've lost my flexibility because of the winds. But God wants to prune me so I can grow stronger. Also, I want to give shade. If you go to the beach, how useful is a palm without leaves? But without being pruned, nothing new grows on a palm. There's no more fruit. So we're complaining about being barren, but we don't want God to prune us in the desert of the situations that we're living. See, this is the God that we're serving. There's so much more into the story, but we don't have time today. I really ask you to go and read this. So this is what we talked last week, that God is ready for us. He prunes us, he prunes our hearts. So as we come to today, today we're coming out of the bat, under the title, you know what? <coughs> Corners and conscience. And if I had my way, I would actually also call it out of the cave and cold. And we read that already, but I'm gonna give it a different swing. David was fully there. He was cutting corners. Yes, we already read it, so there's no surprise on that. But his conscience was also fully there. He was fully there in body. He was fully there in his soul, you know, in his mind. 
And he's also there in spirit. As Christians, most of the times, we don't understand the division between those and how epic and prolific God is to give us something so near to who he is, body. Maybe that is what explains to us the relationship that we have through Christ that came and suffered all things in body so we will be near. So we will understand that he knows. It's not that he didn't know. He wanted to come so near so we understand that even in the body, he was near to us. The body is the part of you that is conscious of the winter. It's the conscious part of you that says, hey, if you use a hammer against your finger, it will hurt. See, if you use a hammer against your finger, you don't hurt your spirit or your soul. You hurt your finger as part of your body. Yeah, are we with? Can I teach for a second? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have the soul, or we call it the mind, because if you have problems with your, your physical brain, I don't want a psychiatrist. I want a doctor that is a neurologist. And actually, that's the, the, the branch of medicine that actually wins the most money, the one that has to do with the mind. Wonder, wonder why. After that is with your reproduction, the urologist, but that's another day. I was curious, so I had to look. <laughs> so it's with the mind that we serve the Lord, and we have been talking about that for the last month. And it's funny that even in the physical, actually it's through that that we understand what is surrounding us in the physical. It's through the body. So Christ came and redeemed even that, and he treats us in the body so we're able to allocate authority to God so we understand that God is superior to what we feel in our body. Are you with me? Second, we have the mind or the soul. That actually, that gives us the conscience of who we are. If you lose your mind, you don't know who you are. That's why people that lose their mind look for a psychiatrist because they don't know who they are. So there's people that develop even diseases that also are spiritual but they happen in the soul. That's where you store what was happy and what was difficult. And that's why you smell something through your physical body, but it reminds you something and you get angry. While your day was awesome, because your soul and your mind is connected to the physical, you get angry or you get really happy. Oh, that's my grandma's perfume. Oh, I'm so happy. I remember her. She was awesome. Oh, if you had a difficult situation with someone and you smell the perfume, your body, your physical informs your soul, your mind, and you lose perspective, you lose hope. Maybe it changes, it triggers things in your soul. You understand what I mean? So we have the physical, the body, we have the mind, the soul, but we also have a different part. That is the third part of how we are designed by God in such a perfect way. Is the spirit. And that's what gives us consciousness of God. When we have become Christians, our spirit received the light of God, received the breath of God, the ruach, the Bible which is explained to us. That means life, life in the spirit. Before that is dormant, and although we might have information, even feel, even be able to obey in the physical, we have no revelation. You understand? Knowledge, revelation are different things. So maybe even our soul is able to react and our body follows through, but it is through the spirit, our spirit side, that we understand who God is. And as a Christian, that is breath, breathed into life. When we say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. I give you my heart. You are my only Lord and Savior. Simple, yeah? But I ask you, how many decisions during the day we never perceive them in that simple plane? We think, oh, this is who I am. But no, maybe that's something that your body's triggered with. Or maybe, no, I had that reaction because I, I didn't sleep enough. And you blame the body for something that was triggered in your spirit. Or maybe in your soul. And David was fully there. David was in that cave. David was living all the situations that he was living through 
the part of him that was the body, through the part of him that was the mind or the soul, and through the part of him that was in touch with God, that will worship God. Are you with me? Is that simple? Should we close it and have a worship time back? No? Okay, let's go. So we have this context, and even in between that, David saw all of our, all, all the things that were going in through his life, through the scope of all these things, but still, he had to decide from being conscious or his conscience. And this is different. When you're conscious of something, by the dictionary, it means that you are aware, you are alert, you are able, you're habilitated, you have the ability to react to, to your surroundings. So David had that, and he proved it. He cut, he cut the rope of his lord, his king. Although in his spirit, he had conviction. And he, was, he had a conscience. And most of us actually never divide what is us being conscious of something and our conscience. We think this is a game of words, but it's not. And it's vital for maturity in Christ for us to understand that the gospel has to permeate not only through our consciousness of our surroundings as how aware we are and how we're able to uh, be able to rely on the Holy Spirit, but we are conscious to also inform us of our decisions. We have that maturity available for us. And as we reach into a relationship with God, like David is doing, we get that to be alive in us. If we go to the context of this, David is in the desert and he's being rejected and persecuted. Nothing like we can actually say today we are going through. See, he's in the desert, in a place that has the ability to kill you because of the drought and the lack of fruits. Or God takes you into a place because you followed him into a place of springs and waters. The unique spring in that area, in that geographical area, God was with David. So David is persecuted, but God is supplying for him. David is rejected by his family, seeing he was young. He was sent as a servant to the fields, but in the fields, God reached out for him and he said, even though people don't see you in your work, in your office, in the relationships that you're in, I am your God and I see you. And I will pull you in the moment that I need to pull you up to the front and I will bless you publicly. That's the story of David. So this is the man that knows what's to be rejected. And because of that, God has instilled in him the love and the compassion, not the empathy, like we said last week, to be able to love, to love the people that were kicked out and rejected on societies around that territory. See, you keep on asking God, why did I go through that? Why did I commit that mistake? What did I did? That didn't end up like I wanted or I thought I needed. And God is saying, hey, you know what? I am working through you. Not only in you, I'm pruning you in a way so you can bear better wings, better fruits, better leaves so you can cover others, so you can be of shade, nourishment for people in that desert, in that situation, in situations that are very similar. Are you with me? So God is... He's using a David that is not only rejected, is not only persecuted, he's using a David that has been declared a king, but he doesn't have a role. He has been kicked out, it seems like. And I know there's a lot of situations that seem like something in our lives. It seems like our crypto is going down. <laughs> it seems like our friends don't understand us. It seems like my family doesn't get it. My new faith, I have found something in God and they don't get it. It seems like it to the eye, but it's not by eyesight, it's by faith that we move. It seems like he doesn't have a role, but he's still anointed. God said, that's the guy. And sometimes it takes a couple of seasons for it to really come to be, or for it to manifest, like the Bible would say in a very prolific, romantic language. You see, sometimes we go through things and we hear God say, hey, I will bless you and I will give you this and the other. And we go through life and we say, when? When is it? I'm in this Engadi, bro. I'm in this, you know, spring that looks all good and luscious and is the only thing alive around. And I might have a reputation among the ones that have been destituted and kicked out, but when is it that I'm going to get the role? 
When is it that I'm going to see the promise? When is it that I'm going to be able to step into what you said you saw in me? When is it? When is it that the church is going to be able to give into the streets the glory of God? When is it that we're going to see in our sidewalks the people, even the shadow of our bodies are going to heal the people? Not because of us, it's because of Christ. When is it that we see that revival? And when is it that we see that awakening? When is it? People that pray, really. This is our frustration. It's not about how people liked us during the week. It's when is it? And that comes to be more reality than the things that we see, than the feelings that we have. What our body explains to us, if it's negative four, then you got to go to church. You see what I mean? David was fully there. And we have a David without role, declared a king, rejected and persecuted, that was growing in a relationship with God. So see, we cannot blame our deserts and our lacks of proof for the growth that we have in our character in our relationship with God. God is looking for a church that is not flimsy, and I won't get tired of saying it. God wants a church that is mature and doesn't get offended easily in the era of offense. Oh, I thought you should have. So, is God God? And I ask you a quick question. What area of you got offended? Your body, your soul, or your spirit? Because if David was living only in his soul, in his body, oh, mighty offense he had. But he was also fully there in his spirit, in his relationship with God, in his conscience. So he was able to navigate the confusion and the offense and the injustice fully there and fully whole. He was able to be expectant even though you slay me, I will serve you. That's the difference between the first tabernacle and the second tabernacle. Moses said, if you do all these things, the law, religion, the Torah. You like those special effects? If you do them, then I will bless you. Ooh, so fancy. But then God brought a man after his own heart and said, even though you slay me, I will still worship. Very different heart. I can do all these things, but if you decide that it's slaying me is better, I'm with you. I still will serve you. I will worship you. David is in the midst of that being pruned. He has been given the authority over people that were less than likely to be that army. They were tough people. They were wounded people. People that actually are wounded, they cannot control themselves from wounding others. So if you have a problem that someone talked about you and you are wounded by that, imagine what's going to happen. You're going to start talking about people because that has wounded you in your soul. And if you are not healed by God, if your soul is not connected and restored by God like David is getting in, you will have no conscience. You'll be conscious, but no conscience. Then you will repeat the wound, and the cycle would start through you again. Are you with me? Is this helping anybody? Can I say an amen? An amen. It happens. In London, we also say amen. Hallelujah. I need that. Can I have hands? You know, can, yeah, I'm also human. I need conscience and conscience. You know, I, I'm, yeah, I'm with you. We also need to be alert. Not only have conscience, because only conscience, but no alertness, no ready to, and not able to explain the gospel to others keeps us stagnant, the Dead Sea. So David needed to keep himself from the Dead Sea and nearer to the spring, the flowing waters. What relationships, what situations are around your life that are stagnant? Learn to separate you, body, mind, and ask God how in the spirit you can separate yourself from the Dead Seas of your life to be able to be nearer to that creek of fresh flowing, that spring of water. Are you with me? Oh, this is going good, eh? Joanna is very sick and in bed. We can pray for her. Please pray for her. 
But she said, don't extend yourself. I know you're too excited today. And I said, I will try. Pray for me. I don't know. She should have prayed harder. <laughs> so we have a God that wants us to be, you know, separated. Not in the sense only of being holy, but to be able to be able to be in situations fully there. Like never before, we have people that don't understand our feelings. They're not able to understand themselves or their own neighbors, their own family members. Like never before, we are very disconnected. When I heard that God, that Jesus said, out of, you know, the abundance of the heart, your mouth will speak, I one day got very curious, and some of you guys have heard me say this. I went and studied anatomically what the heck that looked like. And I found out that the biggest aorta, the biggest vein coming out of the heart, flows into your tongue before it flows into your mind. Go wonder. When God said that, he said it very literally. Out of the fullness of your heart, your mouth would speak. But it also is not only body. It's with our soul. And he uses our spirit as well. So this is not gibberish. It's just saying, are we aware how wonderfully made we are? David, although he was in situations not like we have today, he had not lost that intimacy that informed his soul and his body of how and what perspective he should consider. <clears throat> so as people that are walking with God, the first thing that he wants to do is say, hey, you cannot allow these situations, these pressures, these injustices, this, this turmoil that is going around us as congregation, as his church, as his bride, we cannot allow these things to dictate the temperatures that we have inside. Even though if you slay me, that means you kill me, I still praise you. The outside cannot condemn my soul. It is my decisions and the decisions that I do in my soul, in my mind, that condemn me. Another thing is that God is not only after your heart in the physical. He's after your heart in your spirit, in your soul level. And he talks to you through conscience, through his spirit. You see, the spirit permeates into the body, can affect the body. If you have bitterness, science has discovered that you're more prone to have cancer. Certain types of cancer even more than others. Do you know that? So the spirit permeates into the body. So be careful with the ones that you don't forgive or forget. That's why it's profitable. David would say to his own heart, don't, don't forget any of his benefits. David was so clean in front of God in this sense. He was saying, I cannot forget the benefits that he has to live with you. Body, oh body, oh my soul. I want to remind you, praise God. He will order his body to move. How many times you've been in worship and you didn't even want to lift your hands, but the Holy Spirit came and convicted your soul and you had to react in your body and you say, even if I don't feel it, I'm going to lift my hands to the one that needs it, that wants it, that deserves it. Oh, God. Because it goes through that. See, he wants us to be fully there, not having excuses in any of those areas. He wants us to be fully embraced by God in the physical in our soul and in our minds and through stories like this you say hey, what the heck that has to do with me I'm not in a desert and no one is following me he tries to describe to us in 2022 about to finish a year that has had so many discrepancies with what should be happening in our minds in our pockets in our relationships he's trying to say even though I want you to be fully there. I want you to be witnesses of my goodness. I want you to keep on growing when nothing grows. In the season of the deepest valley of death, I want you to keep on walking because I am with you. Even though Moses was is like, if you, but David was known as that king that says, even though. 
And we have a crown we have been talking about. Areas in our life have a crown that we can use to manifest his glory and his goodness. If we close the book now and we don't finish the notes, so be it. Because I feel the Holy Ghost trying to actually pursue you in such a beautiful way. He's wanting to lift you up. There's things that only you can do. That the Holy Spirit can use you. And he doesn't want to use other than you. Because he sees you in your cave. And he wants you to get out of the cave. David called Saul. But God was calling David out of the cave. We are able to read the story from the perspective that David came out of the cave and called Saul. But what called David out of the cave? It was his conscience. And God triggered it through pruning his heart. God triggered it through showing that his heart was not as good as he thought. And he acted upon his evil. That we all have a little bit, don't worry about it. We all like the Oreos, you know, like there's a little bit of white in the middle, there's black on both sides. Don't worry about it, get used to it. God is treating us and he's treating our spirits. That was very graphical, no? Sorry, there's mint now, mint Oreos this season. So you might choose that one, you know. You're like, it is what it is, don't worry about it. The Lord will help you just to digest that piece of truth, minty. But see, God wants us to live full of him in the midst of these things that we're finding of our own heart. He's in the desert that prunes the palm so he has better, new, fresh shade. He's also there as a wild goat. He was not able to settle even. He was willing to leave his reputation behind and what seemed like the promise for the right timing of God. I will not cut. I will not put my hand upon the anointed one of God oh Lord and he reached into Saul after his men be careful with the people that surround you because the things that God have said to you they might have the knowledge if you explain it to them but they might not have the revelation and what the character of God has produced in your soul you see you can explain to anyone the goodness of God and what he has said to you but they have not receive this in their spirit they can have information they can even have it in the physical they can see you and remember oh that's why you do things ah they might even honor you and see it in their soul level and say hey mm, I know this person this person is very honest they're obeying God they will serve you like that but remember this they might not have the revelation of what God has talked to you about David was able to function in those three, he was fully there. And God is calling a church up to be fully here and fully now. Not you losing time, not looking for excuses, not easily offended, not tired because we have not seen it. He wants us to have resilience. He wants us to be strong and courageous. He wants us like wild goats that are not to despair that keep themselves through the waters and the character, that keeps on flowing, even though I don't see it, even my reputation has gone down, I will keep myself near to the character of God and I will allow my conscience, not only my surroundings to inform me who I am, I will not put my hand on that man. I will not put my hand on the anointed one. I have limits that are ordered by heaven. And in the midst of the turmoil, a church, a congregation that has limits is safeguarded through the spring waters. As we finish, God not only wants to prune and transform us, God wants to finish seasons. He wants to let us know that the season is turning, that the page is being turned by the bigger hand. I know that you have seasons in your life that you don't know if they're going to finish. And maybe you even got used to it. Maybe you excuses with people when you describe those seasons about what God has you living. Maybe you don't even know how to explain anymore because you use the same words. And you're like, how do I explain that I am in the desert? How am I going to explain that I'm still fighting with this situation or with that temptation or with those thoughts? How am I? 
But God says, I'm turning the page. There is a new season coming. And I came to declare it over not only your life, but only my life. I'm coming to declare it over the city of London, over the church worldwide. You will see, and you will see it, and you will hear about how God is turning the page. There's a season that is coming. God is bringing the crown home. And he's using his church to develop the kingdom of God here. So people are blessed. So we have the empathy now and the spiritual compassion to be able to move. That's why he's alerting us. God is using this season. Do you hear me? And not only that, he brings us out of those dark pockets, those caves that we have found in our hearts through spiritual vulnerability. Not only body vulnerability, like he showed to Saul. God is making your heart faint for things that you never fainted about. You have conviction about things, yet you never had conviction. You were used to thinking like that, but God is not allowing you to do it anymore. You're having conviction that is fresh. That means God is in the move. Are you ready for that? That means he will prune you. He will transform you. He will equip you because he's doing something new. You don't have to see it. David, and this is one of the things that if you bear with me, I, I, it really surprised me. I love the Bible. David went out of the cave and he talked to Saul. He said a whole thing. We read it. And Saul could not see him. I wonder if it was dark. Is that you? Because back in the day, there was no light post. David was talking to him. He didn't recognize him because he could hear him. Is that your voice? <coughs> Have you ever thought about that? Maybe it was dark in the cave, but it was also dark in other circumstances. Saul had his own darkness, and he couldn't see properly. Oh, God, help us, Lord. It's not only your darkness that you have to take account for. It's the darkness of your brother, the darkness in your city. The darkness will surround the world. But God said in Isaiah 60 that his light will come upon you. And through you, the glory of the Lord will be manifested. I want to challenge you. David held back the forces. He was not only pruned inside, he was able to manifest the glory, the character of God in his men. That's a leader. He was body there. He was mind there. He was spirit there. God used him because he was changing the story of a generation, of the people that no one wanted, the people that have done even worse things than what you've done, the people that knew in their hearts that should not belong, that they should not have stature and prominence. They should not be even wanted among others. They were bound to a life of loneliness and need, but God, took him to a place because he thought I can use you and I can nourish others and I can bring through your life and as I transform you I can gather others that's what he's saying to us as we're finally closing a year that we have won so much and lost so much I wonder if we're seeing this year fully there I wonder if we have to recap in front of God how we have seen this year maybe that will take us a couple of weeks it took years to David in the desert well, maybe now Instagram helps us it reminds us maybe God is saying something different in this season maybe it's not as cold as our body says maybe our spirit is saying I have a new fire I have a new hope your spirit is touching ground with that of your soul and say, hey, I am more conscious of God and his goodness now than when this year started. Maybe your soul, your, your mind is saying to your body, oh, you soul, oh, you mind, oh, you body. Don't forget the benefits of following Christ. Maybe you have left addictions. Maybe you have left bad bad tendencies that you had eating disorders 
Maybe you started to do exercise. Maybe you have started to be conscious that, you know, without the temple, you cannot really have a testimony that still speaks to people in the sidewalk. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But one thing we're sure is that we're closer to God today than we were the first day that we believed. And David gives us an example how to mature in our deserts, in our loneliness, in our rejection, in our lack of roles and position, with lack of proof that God is with us, that he's good, with lacks and need. He gives us an example how to keep on being a church, a congregation that leads the community to a sound mind, to a healthier body, to a spirit that vivifies us because we are in relationship with him. I know we're in different moments in our walk with God, even in this room. But grab a, hold, grab a hold of this. Allow it to, to sink in through the different seasons that God is taking you and what he's going to take you forward to. Remember that it's by grace you have suffered abuse. It is by grace that you have suffered injustice because his grace is made perfect in your need. And others will understand that even though all these things happen because you have been able to be pruned and go through situations like this and not have lost his character, his input, your connection with his spirit, you will be able to bring goodness and mercy. The same things that are following you, David would say, to others. I believe God wants to bring hope. I believe God is using your life and you don't even know how much he's using you. He's vivifying you. He's connecting his spirit and your knowledge of him and your revelation of him to heal your soul, to heal your heart so you can establish worship and kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. With this, I close. David once said, once you have spoken, twice I have heard it. The glory belongs to God. I find myself thinking, once he spoke, spirit, twice I heard it. Jesus would have said, those that have an ear, let them hear. Maybe my soul heard it, but also David said how his physical heard it. God is wanting to restore you physically, in your mind, emotionally, and he wants to refresh you in the spirit. He wants to set a light. And this word comes to say, hey, I see you. I'm calling you out of the cave, even through situations that you thought you had failed me. You thought your conscience, your knowledge of my character, your revelation call you out of the cave. And I'm ready to make you free. Saul said, now I know that he has blessed you. But that's not the important part for David. He went back to the stronghold with his men. He didn't forget the ones that were with him, the ones that were loyal. He didn't judge them because of their bad judgment and their lack of revelation. He went back to them with the grace, with a new opportunity. He could have been killed. He went back to cement in them leadership. He made them men of valor through knowing who God is. You make your community, your office block, your apartment building, a place of people of valor. The gospel in you is so strong, it will permeate from floor to floor, from conversation to conversation. It will bring life. And that's what God has in you. He didn't go back to get the crown. 
it was still not the season. He went, got, he went back to being pruned. He went back into a place of security, a stronghold, a place that he's surrounded. God sheltered him with new knowledge. He was attacked again and again after that, but he had lived one more thing with God. And that permeated on not only in his body, he permeated in his soul and made him, and made him the king the greatest king of all times. I could have called this several things, but I think the Holy Spirit really wants us to grab this title. That's not gonna be very trendy in, in internet. People see conscience, they're like, wow, ah, no. I don't wanna have one. They don't know that God equipped us with eternity. And conscience is one of the tools that he uses to bless us our growth and our knowledge of his character. You want to join me in your feet? If God has been speaking to you, I want you to join me in your feet. If you're able, if you're not able, it's okay. God sees your heart. Has God been speaking to you? Yeah? Yes. Father, thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for your, your spirit among us, Lord. Father, you know I tried to give it as plain, as simple as you gave it to me. But you didn't need me. Your spirit is in this place. Father, I pray that, Father, we are restored into such a place with you, Lord, that we'll be reconnected if we are not connected now with our minds, with our bodies. Our spirits start flashing your character at us, Lord day in and day out. That through that, Father, we will not only be transformed and, and reap the benefits, but Father, we will be able to invest in others, Lord. Father, you're calling us out of a season. Father, I see so many seasons in this room, Lord. I see that you're, you're a God of our seasons, but I see a God that has urgency as well. I see a God that is not only wanting to connect us, but wants to multiply through us, Lord. I see a God that has taken us out of the dark pockets in our caves, in our shames, and our rejections, Lord, in our needs, Lord, and has given us a new hope to restore others, to stand with others, to show the light of the world, to show who you are. Father, I ask, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Father, that you take what it was yours and is valuable to each one of us out of this message and you will highlight it. Father, that you would, in your kindness, hunt us down with your goodness. Follow us with your mercy. Overtake us with your grace and your goodness, Lord. Jesus. Father, we... We give you this year, Lord, as we're closing the books, as we're taking into account, Father, what we have put in, what we have received from you, what has been taken from us. Father, today we declare you our only needed bread. You're more necessary than our physical need of food. Your nutrients not only permeate into our bodies, but Father, into our spirit, into our soul. Father, today, Father, we ask that you touch, Lord. Father, you unveil, you take bandages that we have used as walking sticks not to face those deserts, those caves, Lord, those dark pockets in our hearts. That you start dealing with us personally. Give us today our daily bread, our portion of your person our portion of revelation, our portion of nearness, Lord. Give us today. Give us today. Father, in every sickness that this season has brought in the body, in the mind, and in the spirit, Father, I come against it. In the name above all names, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, I come against the things that have gotten 
has stood in front of us, have hunted us down and persecuted us, Lord. And Father, I say the season is over. Father, all authority, all strength that has that taken from us, Lord, is retributed to us. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Father, we decide as a congregation, as your people to finish this year. Strong in you and through you and because of you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.